you know, we oftentimes say that um, it's easier to um, work with dead artists because they don't have to <laughs> But in this case, very much alive. And, uh, <laughs> And it's just been an, an entire pleasure, um, Tony. It's like the staff, um, everyone here thinks the world of you, which I think is probably everyone in this room and everybody out there. So, um, so I thank you for your generosity and for um, doing this. I think that, I think um, this is a survey of over 50 years of work, and that's really um, incredibly special. And it's also incredibly difficult to choose exactly what pieces are going to go into an exhibit when you have that. But I think we've done a good job. And I think it's a wonderful uh, cross-section of different parts of your, um, your career and different uh, as, as you've gone forward over the last 50 years. Sounds like a lot. Um, I, I won't go into a lot of detail, but I do think I need to say this. Uh, that uh, he, uh, Tony, uh, who's been a lifelong teacher, graduated from Cal State Long Beach and uh, has remained there in some form as a student, a teacher, and mentor, and after the um, He then went on and had his MFA uh, at Alfred University in New York. There was a little split in time that I'll let you talk about, where he was in Japan for three years, and uh, which is pretty, pretty remarkable in, in itself. Um, I really, uh, I, I first met Tony in this room uh, at a similar situation, and I left that meeting. Uh, thinking he was truly remarkable. And I had just become familiar with his work. And what I love about it, one of the things I love about it, is the, how did you do that? <laughs> you know, and it's like, it's just, it's like magic. And it, so it's just so wonderful to be around numbers of works together where you, um, you, you sit. And you know, and I think that ceramic also has a little bit of, we'll see what happens here. You, there's a certain trust that you have along the way. And I think that's the other part of Tony that I uh, so admire, and that is um, he doesn't have any fear. And he will go in and just start piercing you know, these works within that series. And I said, you know, aren't you afraid it's going to break? And he kind of looked at me and goes, if, you're, if I was afraid it's going to break, I can't do this. He goes, with that said, it always breaks on the last hole instead of the first one. <laughs> so, but he spent um, so much time um, working with that. Um, Tony is a USA Fellow, which is a very, uh, he's won 750 uh, artists over the years. And Tony in 2018 was named a Fellow. Uh, his work is in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, the Museum of Art and Design in New York, Los Angeles Community, or Los Angeles County um, Museum of Art, the Oakland Museum of Art, the Gardner Museum, the Museum of Fine Art in Houston, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, Long Beach Modern Art, or Museum of Art, Aspen Museum of Art, Musée des Arts, Paris, France, Metropolitan, Metropolitan in, um, in New York, we did that, the Young and uh, Laguna Beach, Cranbrook in Taipei, and in Korea at Gino Cultural Foundation. That's just a little bit, but all of those are really significant. I'm going to we, we, create, we, we produced a catalog for this exhibit, um, but we were pretty much in, in, uh, in concert uh, had thought that it really needed to have installation photographs in it. So we did those quickly after it was installed, and then the book went to the printers. So it's printed, it's at binders, it's coming, it's going to be this size, it's going to be hardback, and it's going to be really, really quite beautiful. So uh, we will have um, another uh, time where we can uh, where we will have those books together, and Tony, you will also uh, be there to sign away your life. <laughs> so um, I will let you go forward. Okay. Um, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Yeah. Appreciate you. Yeah. Well. Thank you, Ron, for that and for so many other things. You know, what we've, we've known each other for a long time. We've done a lot of things together in relationship to education. And uh, you've been really wonderful and generous the, the whole time I've known you in so many different ways. And you, you got one thing wrong, though. When you say, I have no fear, I'm full of fear. <laughs> I'm totally full of fear. Are you I, afraid right now? Not so much, but it, <laughs> I just don't let it stop me. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the important point. 
Um, I, you know, I just, um, Ron offered me this, and I wasn't sure I wanted to do it. I said, yes, of course, you know, but I wasn't sure I wanted to do it because I, I have a fear of retrospective exhibitions. I've seen friends kind of like die on the vine um, after a retrospective, stop working. It's like a summing up, a completion of things and what's left to do. And somewhere in the back of my mind, I, I had a fear of that. And so I, I kind of hesitated. I said, yes, but I said, we can't call it a retrospective. We have to call it a survey because I want to keep working, you know. But it's been really a wonderful experience. I have, I've not had an experience like this. Um, and uh, everyone here has just been wonderful, Paul. Uh, the head curator, Ron, most especially, been very generous. Uh, Susie and Steve, uh, the installation team, it's been, it's been wonderful uh, for me. And I've really enjoyed, especially coming in, you know, maybe once a week to meet people here and seeing all the children that they bring through. Uh, they've got a tremendous education program. And so I kind of just trail behind the kids and listen to them talk about my work. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. What are some of the things they say? They ask me if I'm famous. <laughs> are you famous? And, and they said, are you really Tony Marsh? And I said, yeah. He said, prove it. <laughs> He's a kid, you know? So I gave him my driver's license, you know? Okay. You know, something else interesting happened here when I was a student at Long Beach State in probably 1976, 75, 76, I can't remember the, the year, but it's one of those two. And there was a survey exhibition of contemporary makers in, in clay. You know, I think it was, uh, it was from the United States. And I remember seeing the work of Rick Dillingham. May not mean much to anyone. Maybe one or two people in this room. And uh, it's the first time I'd seen his, I hadn't seen that much work in person, mostly in books, you know, and at that time. And I, I was just transfixed by it because um, it, it was, it talked to me, you know, of all the things that were, it was a very mysterious object that he made. And I remember, I remember very clearly uh, my interaction with that piece and, and, and the fact that somehow it gave me permission, you know, artistically, it gave me permission to do things I might not have otherwise done. And there is some bit of Rick's work in my work, you know, like so many other people. And um, Brad Miller's here, his work's in my work too. And I, um, and so here I am, 45 years later, with an exhibition. I hope some young person feels similarly inspired. One person does that, that's great. Yeah. Um, it, so I guess what I'm gonna try to talk about is, you know, ordinarily if I'm giving a talk, it's like I'm talking about a body of work in an exhibition or something like that, but this is different. I have to try to create context for a lot of different things. I, <clears throat> I'll try to keep it interesting and, you know, semi-brief, but we're talking about a long history, you know, a lot of making, and I've been a teacher the whole time. Uh, my whole life I've been a teacher, and I'm not going to talk so much about that, but that's a big part of my identity, and it also has a lot to do with, you know, in some ways why I make what I make or how I make it or how I think about it. All the different wonderful students and colleagues and artists that have come through Long Beach, uh, colleague teachers, full-time, part-time, and otherwise grad students, undergrad students, visitors, uh, resident artists, and things like that have all had an impact on me, you know, and I, and so I'm very grateful for that. I can't really talk about that so much. That's another whole talk, really. Um, but I want to, I want to get started. That's a picture of the book. Okay. These are the people that raised me. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it in the back. Um, I, in fact, if I do that, well, that's a little clearer. But these are reading glasses, so you're all fuzzy, you know. But I don't know if you can see that in the back, but these are my parents. And <clears throat> probably, at least by this pairing of pictures and information, they're, they're the odd couple, you know. And uh, my dad was a poet and a writer, and my mother was a ballerina for American Ballet Theater, and uh, left home at 14, uh, right after the Depression. She would have been 101 a couple days ago. Um, left home after the Depression at 14, never went to high school, and became a professional dancer in San Francisco with a, with a ballet opera. And then just lived a life as a dancer until she was 40, danced on Broadway, and then spent the rest of her life trying to learn how to draw and paint, which she was really masterful at. Kind of being a classicist and being self-disciplined and working hard. Um, painted beautifully, drew beautifully, did everything very well. Whatever she did, she did it well. And, uh, 
And my dad was a bohemian to become hippie <laughs> yeah, poet. And um, here he's in his truck, you know, with a sign stating what he is and handing out poetry on the street corner to anyone that would take it that he had written because he thought art was a gift and poetry was a gift. And he also had a hard time selling it. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I was born in New York City. And because my mother was dancing there. And uh, we left when her career finished at about 40. She was dancing on, and um, after the ballet, she also uh, danced in Broadway musicals, original Broadway musicals, about 10 of those. <clears throat> but at some point, a dancer has to stop dancing, you know. And uh, at 40, she decided it was, she'd had enough. We went to, we moved from New York to Big Sur, which, <laughs> which is like a, 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 a massive dislocation, you know. <laughs> Uh, but I loved it. I, I was really, you know, as a kid in New York, I, I would beg my mother to take me to the Natural History Museum. She would take me to the Met instead, because she wanted to look at paintings, and I would just stand there and look at musty paintings, you know, big, giant paintings. But I really wanted to go to the Natural History Museum and look at the animals and stuff. So I was thrilled to live in Big Sur. And ironically, we, we moved next door to the Westons, the, the Edward Westons brood, you know, all the Westons were there. And so I grew up with his grandkids and became introduced to his, uh, the, the, you know, black and white photography uh, had a huge impact on me. And uh, seeing Ed Weston's stuff when I was nine, 10 years old, uh, 11 years old, and all the other great photographers that lived in the Monterey Bay area. So uh, I went to high school, went to community college there. And uh, this piece is in, I'm, I'll talk mostly about pieces in the exhibition, but there's some other pieces that are, will be included in the talk that are not. This is the first thing I ever made in high school. And when I was in school, all I wanted to do was play baseball. That was it. In fact, I, um, I was a terrible student. I flunked high school. I stand here proud to say that, you know, because I did well after that. Once I realized how humiliating that was, I thought, yeah, you know what? I better shape up here and not just, uh, and so I did quite well in school after that. But um, that's because all I did was play baseball all day. I just, I got the key to the hitting, I was hitting, I was doing anything I could to become a better baseball player. It was my focus, you know. And then I ran into ceramics and um, I hurt myself. So my, I, it looked like I wouldn't have a professional career as a baseball player, which is all I wanted. And I hurt my arm and I ran into ceramics my last semester there and, and a fabulous teacher. And I think anyone, anyone in the audience now that, that um, has had one great teacher in life, you know how, um, how life-changing that is. In fact, that's what teaching became for me. I, I wanted to change lives. I didn't want to teach a subject, you know. And so he did, and he, he was wonderful. And I, I remember, you know, going in, I was only there for a semester, but uh, he invited me to teach with him that summer. I became a teacher right away while I was making stuff. I don't, I don't know what he saw in me, you know, but he invited me to teach in the summer session after I'd had one semester of ceramics. And, he handed me that pot uh, hot out of the kiln when I walked in. And uh, I, I couldn't believe I made it. I was like, wow, this, is <laughs> this is amazing. I struggled a lot. It was on the wheel, you know. And uh, he wouldn't teach us anything. He wouldn't teach us how to throw. He just had to figure it out, you know. So it was slow. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. So um, I, I, that, this little pot is only here because my mother saved it, you know. And, um, and it, it literally changed the trajectory of my, of my life, you know. And I, I remember shortly thereafter, in, as an undergraduate, standing at a water fountain in Long Beach State, I, I took a drink of water, I stood up, and I just said to myself, I may have said it out loud, I don't know if anyone, I don't think anyone heard it, but I said, I will never do anything again in life to earn money. It's not related to ceramics. I just announced that, you know. And... Uh, I, it was just increasing clarity that this would be my life, you know. And so, um, and I've held true to that pretty much. I haven't had to. I haven't had to do any roofing jobs or, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, so this was important to me. I, I went through school. I, um, I, um, I don't know how I felt about school. I, as an undergrad, I didn't, I, I, I felt like my, the problem was my teachers didn't make anything for the most part. I didn't like it. I didn't want to be taught by an academic, something that was very physical and even metaphysical. I wanted to be taught by a practitioner, you know, someone who had the wisdom of a maker, and not just a theory about making stuff. I didn't like it. Even then, I knew it, you know, as a kid. And 
Um, so I didn't want to go to grad school. I wasn't inspired to go to grad school when I finished my BFA. And I had the opportunity to go to Japan. And I, I wasn't really that interested in, in Japan or Japanese pottery, as like a lot of people were at the time. But I had the opportunity to go, so I took it. And I ended up going to Mashiko, which is in north of Tokyo, and in a small town called, a small town called Mashiko. There, there's a group of potters there that kind of had formed the, the Minge movement. You may or may not know about that. But it's, um, the, the Minge movement is kind of a made by hand, anti-industrial um, you know, kind of champion of, of, the, of the handmade, the anonymous. That, that's, that's the British and the Japanese getting together to kind of form this idea, this philosophy, and this way of working. And that is a picture of, on your right, Shoji Hamada, and then on your left, Tetsuzo Shimaoka. Both became living national treasures. Um, as decreed by their, by their government. And uh, both were, Shimoka was Hamada's apprentice, first apprentice and lived next door. So I was able to go study with um, Shimoka. And uh, I showed up, um, I said I'd go for three years, I went for three years exactly to the day. <laughs> I left three years to the day. Um, and it was, a, it was a remarkable experience, mostly it was, it, was, it was even maybe more dislocating than moving from Manhattan to Big Sur. Simply because uh, the culture is so culturally different. I was way out in the countryside. Um, uh, I didn't speak the language. I didn't come prepared for weather. You know, I came from Southern California. And I just, I didn't know anything. I never traveled. I didn't speak the language. And so I showed up in Birkenstocks and short sleeve shirts and stuff in November. It's like it's a really bad idea. They just looked at me like, uh-oh. <laughs> and not another one of these guys, you know. And, um, but it was, really, it was really magical there because it was like stepping back in time. And it was a lot that way because the, the people that worked there were farmers. And, and in a farming tradition, the people that worked in the pottery were farmers. And, who had become potters. And some had started when they were 13 or 14, and that, by the time I got there, they were almost 40. And they were amazingly accomplished crafters, you know. So skilled, it was unbelievable, you know. So to watch them work and to see all these traditional uh, methodologies and spaces that, that, um, that were very simple because they had been worked out over the years. All the bugs had been worked out, and so everything was simplified, and it worked. And, um, and so I got to try to find my, a way to blend into this. I was, I was not there as a student. I was being paid to work. And so I had to do the work of the pottery and figure out the language. And all the older guys that were there, um, like I said, were farmers. They spoke a local dialect that was very thick. And um, it wasn't written down anywhere, so I couldn't look it up. And even Japanese from Tokyo would come and listen to them talk, didn't know what they're, <laughs> had no idea what they're saying. And half of the men that, that, including Shimoka, fought in World War II. So very interesting, you know, very interesting to be there. And they pranked me every chance they could. Just the, the, they're farm boys in a way that never grew up, you know, and they just, they used me um, as a, kind of a laughing stock. You know, they would play jokes and tricks on me and stuff. And I, I liked it, it was, it was fine, you know, but, um, uh, that's me on the, me and both those. Me on the left, my first week there, and I have a pair of pants that I washed in the washing machine and put them on the line to dry, but it, they froze. And I was like figuring things out slowly, you know. And then on the right, I'm um, um, helping Shimoka make something a little bit later. And uh, you can see he's just kind of saying, would you let go of that? You know, I, <laughs> I just wanted to be in the picture, I think, you know. But this house that I lived in was a small, it was a two-story house, but it had no insulation, no hot running water, no flush toilet, um, no heating, and you know, gaps between the boards, and, and a woodshed for all the wood for the wood fire behind the house. So everything that lived in a wood pile li lived in my house, too. Every insect, every rodent, you know. And I really loved it, actually. I, I thought it was, and after three years, to come back to the States, and see a rug on the floor and turn a tap and have hot running water, you know, there's like, like a miracle to me. Like I said, they did a lot of things that were very, very traditional. It was about, it was about maintaining traditions, really, bringing traditions forward, you know, like, like, like good craft does. And, and being a little bit innovative, but so they used wood burning kilns, they used kick wheels, they used local clay, they used local materials for glazes. 
Um, they hybridized forms from all over the world, really in a way, that was part of Hamada's thing. But, so I was steeped in a very successful, highly organized, well-run pottery, you know, and, I, and I, I was there for three years, and the longer I was there, the more responsibilities I got. He told me I could leave after two years, and I said, no, I don't want to do that. I, I don't understand the language well enough, I want to stay, and he liked that, because then he had one more year of me working at very low wages, making money for him, you know. I don't say that disparagingly, you know, as, as it should be. But um, he then asked me to become his apprentice and sit next to him in a private studio on a wheel next to him and help him when he knew I was going to be there longer. And so that was a great, very, very complicated, difficult experience for me, but um, a great experience. So after three years, you know, I, I kept thinking all along, what am I going to do when I go home? You know, like, I'm going home to something so different, so uh, foreign in America to, to become a potter. And that's really what the experience was preparing me for in a way. But I just, I wasn't buying it, you know. I, I, I wasn't buying into the fact that I was going to transition back home and become a potter. And that's because uh, I, I, I saw how relevant pottery was in Japan. It was, it's an integral part of daily life. And it's, um, it's woven into the daily fabric of everything. You know, pottery is in every home. They all, a pottery shape is a pottery shape. You know, and they, it, they, it's not ambiguous. It is what it is. And it's a rice bowl because it's not a soup bowl because it's a certain shape and size. And, and it's, it's not, you know. And so they, they have a very, very deep, uh, highly defined connection to pottery. And so potters are really prized. They're, they're, they're celebrated. They're like rock stars. They're like, they're like big time painters. They make their, their, you know, Shimoka and Hamada were millionaires from the, from the sale of their work, as were a lot of other potters. And um, they were celebrated at books and TV shows and, you know, and, and I knew I wasn't coming back to any of that. <laughs> and I, and so it was really interesting, uh, the process that I had to go through to try to understand how to transition back to the States. This is, this is one of the last things I saw um, just before I left, and I, I really loved it. I loved a lot of his work, actually. And I loved his work because I felt like he wasn't, he, he wasn't a historical recreationist, you know. It wasn't a Potemkin village or anything. He, he was a modernist potter um, with traditional roots, and he kind of, he kind of marched into, into deep historical history in, in Asian ceramics, you know, pan-Asian ceramics, and elbowed out some space for himself, you know. He wasn't trying to innovate something radical. He was trying to go into history and, and make space for himself, which is really hard to do in, in Asia. And he did it, you know, with his work. And so I love that about him. I thought that was profound. And I, what, I, what I thought was really remarkable about that was that he was somebody in his moment, in his time, in his place, who was making something that was a record of all that. All that was encoded in his work. And, um, and I thought, yeah, that's what I want to do. <laughs> I want to be like him. I don't want to make his work. You know, I don't want to come back and be a, a kind of a half-assed um, you know, Japanese recreational potter. I, I, making bad Japanese stuff here in the States. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to be like him. How you do that in, in America is a little more complicated as an artist, you know. But I, I wanted, I, that's the lesson that I took home with me and, um, and set out almost immediately to try to find out how that would happen. Um, and so that, that became the journey that I was going to be on, you know, when I came back. So these, these pieces are pieces that, I, that are, I made almost immediately after returning to the States. There's three of them over there starting with stuff in the show now. And um, I came back and I went to Mendocino. Some of you might know that way up the coast. And there's an art center there. And I helped them found a ceramics program at the Mendocino Art Center. And I was, it, was, it got me back into teaching, you know, after Japan. And it, it, gave, me a, it gave me roots and an anchor, you know. And I started making stuff. And it was, the, it was the first time I wasn't in a class making stuff for a teacher or sitting at a wheel in Japan, making stuff, you know, for, you know, whatever, the, you know, for sale for them, for, on order, you know, like make, make 200 teacups, you know, whatever. Um, and so I was thrilled 
that I wasn't, I, I wasn't being interfered with. You know, <laughs> I could just make the things I wanted to make. I was in heaven, I really was. And um, it, it's kind of started a, started a long um, journey in the studio that's been interestingly private, private in some ways and quiet and meditative and a, a process that plays out uh, about curiosity and, and in some ways very public and communal as a teacher, you know, so I, I'm kind of toggling between those worlds. And I don't think they're really good bedfellows, to be honest. I don't, you know, a lot of people say, oh, they go together. You know, I don't think they really go together that well. But um, that's, that's the life I had to create and somehow find a way to keep making stuff and, and to be a, um, a consequential teacher. I thought it was my obligation to be, to be consequential um, in both, really, you know. But as a teacher, um, I felt like I always wanted to give students more than they paid for somehow in, in setting up a program and teaching with the whole program, you know. Um, so with making these things, I kind of started to teach myself how to see, how to think, you know, how to react to stuff. Th this is just like a, came from putting a wire through uh, porcelain clay to throw it and just looking at the clay and saying, oh my God, that's beautiful. How do I, how do I work with that wire cut instead of what I'm making? And learning how to appreciate whatever stop, you know, arrest your attention and then how to act on it artistically. And get something in the world, a little whisper, and then how to grow that thing into something that you know becomes that goes as far as you can take it. You know, so this was the beginning of that. It was like a two-year process to figure that out, and and it taught me a lot about who I was going to be, you know, as a maker and how I would approach things. Uh, I went back to school because if you want to teach, you have to have a master's degree. You know, it's just the way it is. And so I, I had to go back to school, but it's ten years in between, as Ron said. And, um, and I went to upstate New York, the school up there, got my master's degree. But, but by the time I was done, it was 11 years, if you count three in Japan, 11 years worth of education. How long do doctors go to school? <laughs> you know, I don't know. Uh, luckily, school was cheap back then. Unfortunately, I say that now. It's like stupid, expensive. And um, three degrees, six institutions, you know, of assorted kinds between junior colleges. And, and 15 teachers, if, if I count them all, you know, including Japan. And so that's a lot. That's a lot. And that's a lot of preparation, you know. And I, and I think I'm grateful for it because, um, you know, hopefully life is long and you're well prepared and you understand how to create a way in and out of trouble artistically, you know. And I think that just being around all those people and then plus all the people I've been around since, um, it's just helped me become kind of a, a more just a, an overall creative person and a problem solver. And, So this is, I went to grad school. I, I decided to be experimental, which means you don't know what's going to happen, right? If, you're, if you know what's going to happen, it's not experimental. So I was being experimental, and just I, I decided I wasn't going to do anything I knew how to do. I just invent everything. So I worked with, with over-life-size figuration um, based on stones I found in the creek that I took molds off of that felt figural to me, and I'd build these animal, human hybrid, um, human bird hybrid forms. Uh, from that, and I also was making other things that uh, just that you know I just gave myself full permission to do anything I wanted to do, and I would critique it later. You know, don't critique it first; leave it alone. Just make it, let it be in the world, and then then have a good conversation with it. And so, interestingly, the stuff you know, the figuration just didn't stick with me. But uh, kind of the uh, this is a, a wooden box with uh, soda ash in it. And, you know, the, the the idea of the vessel, which became so important to me in Japan, the power the power of the vessel to me is. It's one of the more profound human inventions that, uh, that has helped shape culture that we know. It's pan-cultural, you know, every culture did it, has done it. So I've been fascinated by that. I think that my curiosity about that is there's, there's, all, there's always gas in the tank because I keep running into stuff I had no idea existed that some culture invented to solve a problem using the vessel, using clay, and it just seems endless to me. And, um, <coughs> So uh, the idea of working with vessels became more natural, and, and when, I came back from Japan, when I came back from grad school, I came back to the, to the West Coast to teach, and at Long Beach State I was hired, and there was a job open. Um, I hurt my back, so I had to kind of scale down a little bit, and vessel making seemed appropriate, but like, like I'd learned in Japan a few years earlier, I couldn't be a potter. But the thing that I started to understand more and more was that it could be the subject matter of my work, you know. 
Um, and so these are some of the things I made, and they're, you know, they're in the room, actually. Uh, some of the things I made, when, when I, I had no gallery representation, but I was making things anyway, and just dropping them off with friends. And uh, thank God, my friends held onto them, so they're here, you know. But they were kind of based in the natural world. They were from stones and fossils and, 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 and water, you know, from the, the wire-cut porcelain objects and sand dunes and, you know, probably a lot of things I'd seen in Western photography and, um, and things that were around me from Big Sur and Mendocino, very, very powerful, beautiful places. Upstate New York's very powerful and beautiful too. The natural world and how to, how to process that and how to deal with it artistically and form some kind of a language. This is the subject right there. And I started to make things that I called reliquaries. You know, I'd, I'd, been to a, I'd been to Europe for the first time and I saw reliquaries in museums and in cathedrals where you have a very important object that's a venerated object in a, in a, in a vessel that's made for it, that's made to hold it, you know, whether it's a thumb or <laughs> whatever. They cut those saints up, man, and just carve them up and make reliquaries for them. And I, and I so the idea of a reliquary in a vessel, you know, it's just it's continuing to go deeper. And, I, and so, I remember making things like this and feeling like, uh, even back then, it had to do with fishing. I fished as a child. And I, the, from the time I was fishing as a 12-year-old until I was fishing as a 20-year-old, the, the kinds of things you could catch fell off dramatically. The size of fish, the types of fish, and it really alarmed me. I, I, I thought, wow, the, the natural world's changed so fast. And so radically, and why? What's going on? And that was just in relationship to fish, nothing else, you know. But that was in the 90, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. And so I made things that I just called reliquaries, um, reliquaries for the natural world. And this was one of them. And, and I would take a, take a fern frond, cast it in, in clay, and, and then make a, make a bed for it in the stone. This is in this room somewhere. I don't know, it's right, right over there. Um, and, and then other things, I was just trying to find my way, find a language, try to find a way to say things and use vessels. So it, it started to seem pretty natural to fill a vessel with something. Because if you think about the history of pottery um, as a subject, then you, there's a very short, beautiful list of things that pots have always been asked to do, regardless of the culture. You know, it's like hold things, preserve things, present things to beautify, to ritualize, to commemorate, you know, but that's, that's the job of a pot, good piece of pottery. So I took that list and I used that list, you know, as a way to think about making stuff and using vessels. So this is a portrait of a young man, this is a little self-portrait, and it's kind of like my torso, then filled with a lot of objects that were uh, cast from, from plants um, that I was around. And then I, I did hurt my back, and so I had to sit down and make things for almost a year that were a lot smaller. And this is like a little head, these are little head shapes, you know. They're, one's in the show. And um, <clears throat> going back to that object I made in grad school a few years earlier that had that box with those, with those kind of those uh, mathematical balls. Um, they're, they're kind of Celtic, I believe, in, in origin. They're stone and they're carved, they're mathematical formulas. And, um, location stones and things like that, and I, I really liked them as objects. And so finding different ways to make vessels that felt consequential and to place objects in those vessels and um, to, to, to activate the vessel um, as an arena where something was going to happen, you know, where, uh, where I was going to deliver a message of some type, right? And as time went on, um, I... Um, the idea of making vessels as commemoration was really interesting to me because th there's a deep, wonderful, rich history of that, you know, from, merit, from Elvis plates <laughs> to way back to the Greeks commemorating um, a war or a battle or something. And even, even, even the Egyptians making um, um, jars that had paintings on them that had inventories of things that were on a boat. It was like a, it was a record, you know. Um, and not, not to mention cuneiform, you know. But um, so I, I liked that a lot. I thought that was rich. And I, I started to make things that were, because one of the problems with people working in clay of my generation, maybe not so much anymore, but is we, we felt like we always had to go so deep into history. There's so much history, and you're always echoing back from a really deep history. 
And I didn't really want to do that, and um, I wanted to be more kind of contemporaneous, and so I started to kind of map and commemorate events from my life, you know. And this is, and so I called this a marriage vessel, you know, it's when I got married. Um, I wanted to celebrate that, and so I made, I made a whole series of marriage vessels. There's some, there's one in the show. I had a hard time getting things back, by the way. I lost track of a lot of stuff, first of all. Um, but um, there's one in the show. And it started, it, it was a really interesting problem. Like, how do, you, how, do you, how do you develop the language to say that? And it, and it wasn't just about me. It, it certainly, um, the, the language was minimal. The sculptural language was minimal. And so I wanted everything to be essential. And so the shapes were all essential. The surface was essential. The, um, the titles were essential. The, the driving force behind the work was essential. It was, um, um, it, they were essential human experiences along with my own personal experience. So I didn't personalize it, but I kind of humanized it, you know, and tried to find a language that would be kind of universal and kind of timeless. At the time, that's what I was thinking. So these, these things are not set. These, these two pairings of different types of objects in an arena, they're not set, they can be moved around. And, and essentially everything I made thereafter was never fixed in place, you know. It was always loose and arrangeable or rearrangeable. And I tried to come up with lots of different ways to present and stage things in vessels. It's another marriage vessel. Um, I, I was also aware of scale, you know, like each of these bowls is about two feet. So the whole thing is, you know, like that. It's a little bit out of the normal scale of pottery, a little bit out of the normal scale of a tabletop object. And nothing had a flat bottom. Everything moves and rocks as, it, as it's, a, it's a pure, complete form. And um, it's also not a ceramic shape. I mean, the bowls are, but that little connector in there is not a good idea, you know. <laughs> and, and there's a reason why a lot of shapes are ceramic shapes and some shapes are metal shapes, you know. And, but I, I wanted to kind of, it was hard, you know. I was trying to develop this language, and that, um, and I didn't want to echo, um, kind of culturally identifiable types. I didn't want people to look at it and say, "Oh, that's Japanese," you know. "Oh, that's Greek," you know, or something like that. It comes out of that that really rich, powerful language. I mean, we think about Greek pottery. That's almost what identifies the Greek culture. I mean, it, they're so powerful these things, and. So I was trying to find a form language that was more modernist, that was more minimalist, and um, there were minimalist sculptors working in LA in the early 90s, and I liked that. And um, so I was trying to find a, a pottery language that slipped between the cracks of history, you know, with, with pottery form. But there were shapes, you know, and, and clear forms. It's another marriage vessel. And I didn't want, you know, they're minimalist, really, objects, and so I didn't want them to be too small. I thought they're too small to be dismissible because they're, they're already simple enough, you know. But if they're small and tabletop, you know, things like this, they'd be too dismissible. So I jumped them up just a little bit, but they're still intimate, you know, they're still related to the body. They're about half the size of me, you know. Um, we got pregnant with our first child, have two kids. They're both right here. <laughs> Give him a hand. <laughs> it's Walker and so. And give him a hand because they had to put up with me. <laughs> right. They've been they've been really beautiful about that. I, I, I wanted to say, you know, that it takes support from so many people, but most importantly, your family. And my kids have been very generous about not having a dad. You know. <laughs> Studio rat, that's what I am. Um, um, and so I, uh, I, I made a series of fertility vessels uh, to kind of commemorate the idea of fertility, uh, coupling fertility, not so much birth or birthing, but fertility. And so yeah, I had to figure out, you know, the, the, all of the kind of the improbability of fertility, you know, and how that happens. And, um, and so I made a series of vessels that um, kind of had that landscape built into them. And I, you know, the palette, I was a very shy person. I'm still shy, but not as shy as I used to be. And the, the palette 
choices I made with my work had everything to do with the minimal language. And I, I didn't want to be all over the map with color. I didn't feel comfortable with it. I didn't understand color and what it meant. It, you know, things had to mean something. And the, these works are, um, they're, they're, they're extremely planned. <laughs> you know, they're, they're planned, they're, they're, they're rational. There's a plan that has to be followed. There are craft protocols that have to be followed to get this to work and look the way you want it to look. And <clears throat> I, I was, I, it's so funny, I was in a conversation with a historian, contemporary historian the other day, and she said, oh, you're, you're, you're sloppy craft. You're one of the sloppy, I was like, what? <laughs> you know, sloppy craft, are you kidding me? I'm highly trained, you know? She's talking about the work in the front. Anyway, uh, th these things were, you know, they were thought through a lot. There was a plan, there was a blueprint in order to make them. And, um, and I liked it, I worked that way, you know. Um, and so color was interesting because I wanted the color to be meaningful, so the, co the color of clay is really beautiful to me, really beautiful. And so that was good enough. And I used terracea gelato so I could kind of polish the surfaces down and that would be like skin, you know. It's kind of strange quality about them. And I used white and I used blue and I used black and brown. Those are all really kind of earthen sky, sky, water colors, uh, earth colors and things. I understood those because I felt like I could deal with the meaning. And color is rapturous, you know, and wild. And, not, not so easy to explain. Maybe you shouldn't even try sometimes, you know. But so I, being shy, and also coming from Japan, you know, where I really felt the power of restraint. The power of restraint in Japan is a serious thing, how it operates on people and in culture. And I could see how powerful restraint was. And I kind of liked that. I thought, yeah, restraint's powerful. So I kind of held back a lot with my work, a lot of restraint in the work, because I thought it was powerful. And I was shy, those kind of, those two things. So, uh, so for 20 years, <laughs> brown, blue, mostly brown, a little bit of blue, some black, and white. That's it. Um, another fertility vessel. And, and this one, if you turn it over, you'd see that it was, it's kind of like a body. There's kind of like legs and a torso and belly and a chest. And not, not explicit, you know, or anything, but the suggestion of that. And so the, it's, it's interesting, and I'm, I'm dealing with the abstraction of body parts and um, the abstraction of the body and in a vessel. And so the, the figuration is, is too powerful a word to use, but um, there, there's a little bit of that in the work. You know, the work's not about figuration, but it, it contains some of those aspects. Um, so I think, uh, you know, these things, again, just finding different ways to make use of vessels. I cleaned up my studio one day. I had all these objects. And so I built a vessel to contain them. Um, I, there were things I could have thrown away, you know, but I kept them and I kind of uh, memorialized them in a vessel. Um, I, I had this in an exhibition in the 90s at Frank Lloyd, maybe. I think it was Frank Lloyd's in LA. And my daughter called them muffin tins. I remember that. Yeah. Um, I just called them inventory vessels because it was just a way to take a momentary inventory of something and present it. I think this is what you call a muffin tin. Uh, but this kind of got back uh, a lot of, you know, like I didn't just work on one thing at a time. I was, I was doing lots of different things, uh, the intersections between different bodies of work. I've never hardly ever done just one thing for very long. I've always worked on two or three different bodies of work. And so they, there's a lot of hybridizing sometimes and things mix and match. It's, it's a wonderful firing squad, you know, they, things just bounce around and uh, sometimes you find different homes for ideas that way. Um, I made, this is, a, this is another reliquary for the natural world, and this is from my garden. Um, I grow a lot of uh, esoteric plants, uh, rare plants, endangered species, and things like that. I've done that for a long time. And um, I, would, I would just go around in the springtime and harvest different parts of the plants, uh, mostly the re reproductive parts of the plants. That they're, these kind of plants are cycads. If you probably might not know that, but... Um, they've been on the planet for 250 million years. They predate flowers. They're remarkable. Their, uh, their fossil record is like their living record today. They're kind of unchanged. They're strange, beautiful plants to me. And I, and I can grow them in Southern California, so I've been collecting them. And I'm a steward of those plants. I'm, I'm not a gardener. Um, I'm uh, kind of a caretaker of a collection of plants. And, and when I'm done, 
these plants will go to someone else. And I was at, a, at, a, at an exhibition, Ashwini Bhatt and her husband, Boris Gander, were reading yesterday. And he, in his poetry, in his talk, he read and spoke about plants that, um, I guess it goes back to ancient um, Indian poetry, but about, about a certain type of plant that maybe doesn't age, doesn't die. The concept of mortality is human, you know. But some plants go on forever. And these plants are a little bit like that, these cycads. They, they've got rooting systems and plants that keep coming up out of the same roots, and they'll go on forever unless something kills them, you know. So there's, some, there's something fascinating about these plants, and I've, I've engaged them in my art uh, for a while by taking parts, taking molds, and then finding a way to present them like that. And, um, I, uh, and, and so you, you get the, in this case, uh, it's a little somber because it's a reliquary, you know. But um, I've done it in different ways too. Uh, so there, it's a commemorative vessel. And this is also a commemorative vessel. In the 90s, we had big storms like we've just had. The ocean washed up lots of stuff. And um, I collected it and, and took it home. A lot of really interesting things that washed around the ocean and kind of lost their definition and their identity. You know, there's tennis ball guts and all kinds of stuff in here. And um, took it home, and I think you were with me that day in, in uh, Newport, and all kinds of stuff, big bags full of stuff. We took it home, and I worked on it slowly and, and also turned them into ceramics and um, made homes for them in vessels that, so to kind of commemorate a walk on the beach, you know. Um, and, and memorialize these things and kind of unify them and homogenize them and democratize them in a way, um, in, in all in ceramics, lots of different ways I did that and turned them into ceramic and then made different homes for them. These also from the garden, the cycads in the garden and some other plants and kind of making botanical landscapes with porcelain. This one too. Some of them in, that, in, in those days were more masculine Masculine plant parts, some are more feminine plant parts. Uh, sometimes it was mixed. I'm showing this, it's not in the show, but I'm showing it because uh, I really love making this and it also points to the idea that I wasn't just interested in pottery shapes, although the bowl's a pottery shape, but this beaker, I had to make three of them. It's just about four feet like that, and so doomed to break, right? I had to make three to get one, and then I, I sent that one up to a gallery and of course it broke. You know, but. But I didn't care about that. Um, I wanted to make it, and I wanted to see it, and it's not a ceramic shape. And that was part of my idea about just uh, arguing with, with ceramic shapes and, and trying to find other ways, and, and certainly learning why that certain shapes are not ceramic shapes, you know, but I knew it going in. And, and, and how do you build this thing? You know? uh, first of all, I like that challenge. And then, um, you know, th this is when I'm still putting things in vessels, and this, this uh, water, is that up on the screen? A little arrow? Maybe, you know. The, the water in there is a shape that comes out. And I found that when I put the water in there, when I set it in there, it, it raised the tip of the beaker off the, off the, just, it caused it to levitate. It was like very serendipitous, you know. But, and so any vibration in the room or currents, and this thing was moving and spinning, and it's like, yeah, that's gonna break. <laughs> but there was something kind of magical about making this object, and that, that was enough for me, you know. Another commemorative vessel, you know, I, I call them messengers, messenger vessels, commemorative vessels, you know, I want to send a message or commemorate something important. This was for a friend who died. And uh, it's another torso shape, abstracted, but it's, uh, he's a very complicated person, uh, artist, really wonderful artist, had gr great influence on a lot of people. And he died a little bit young, premature. Um, and he was very complicated, so I kind of made this to memorialize him. And I was asked to speak, and, but I wanted to make something, and I did. He was a great maker. And, um, and so uh, it, it, it was full of weapons and flowers for him, because that's the way I felt about him. He was dangerous <laughs> and beautiful, you know. <clears throat> it's also in the show. This is in the show, and I start to deal with color because the interesting thing to me about my work over a long period of time, and I kind of understood it finally by putting the similar bodies of work next to one another. If you've walked through the show, you'll see it and room by room, is that if you work on something, most bodies of work here have been worked on for 10 plus years, you know, and sometimes simultaneously with other things, but just um, kind of interrogating a subject 
and, and going as deeply into something that, as I can go until I've completed. I've done as much as I think I can do. And before I start making bad copies of my work, it's time to stop and become curious about something else. Usually something takes over, you know. I be, I'm just, I'm, I'm hardly ever bored, you know. I'm just curious about a lot of stuff. Can't even get to most of it, really. But I discovered uh, my inclinations are to really go deep into something and try to suss it out as much as I can in front of me in, in objectness, you know. And once I do that, there are certain things over a period of 10 years when you're making stuff, you know, that does not go away. It's always there. It, it, there are certain things that go away and certain things that are always there. And those things that are there, the, the best word I can think of to describe that is that what you're doing is you're building institutions in your work to your ideas, the, your essential ideas. And once I, it's part of the contrarian that was in my mother, that's in me, um, once I really could identify those institutions, I just wanted to break them. You know, it's like time to break that thing. And so one of the institutions in my work had to do with not using color. And I just, I thought that at some point I was like, I have to stop being chromophobic, you know? I have to stop <laughs> being so afraid of color. Look at me today, you know? <laughs> Still suffering, but uh, not so much in the work. And I had to deal with color. I had stuff kind of, I don't know if I was running away from it, but I was avoiding it. And I, so I kind of decided to run at it, you know, and just figure it out. And the thing about color, anyway, I've said a lot about it already, but the thing about color in ceramics is that it's a very unique, has a very unique chromatic life that's different than other color. And it's also very phenomenological, which means that a lot of things happen that you can't, they're, it's alchemy, you know. It's things you can't control, things you can't even explain or don't want to explain. Um, and so I started to work more with color and just ease my way into that. And I don't, I don't have a gradation of my work that shows how quietly I did that. I, I just, you know, I show you that and I show you some other things too. This was something that I'd, I'd been on airplanes once a month for half a year going somewhere. I always got a window seat. I thought, man, I better get a camera. This is great. And so, uh, this is the nineties and I took a bunch of pictures and I thought, you know, I should make this. I should make the sky and these clouds, and, you know. I, because my, the language of vessels and objects was so becoming so ingrained and familiar, I could use it to interpret things. And I liked that. That's what I wanted. I, I wanted to be fluid, you know, like, like people, some people are really fluid with language and with writing um, in, in their life's work. And they, they, can, they, can make, they can make something sing, you know, to other people. And I, I felt like I was starting to get that a little bit because I'd done it for 20 years. And so I would have ideas. I, I would pay attention to the world I was in. I'd have ideas and I'd find a way in my language to make, to make those happen, whether anyone knew it or not, you know, but that's the sky enveloping clouds. These, these are right behind me on this plinth. They came a little bit later. Uh, so this is a little bit out of sequence, but I, it's, it's another thing where I, if you, if you look at the history of my work everywhere here and, and beyond, it, there's no corners, there are no right angles because they're so hard. If you work with clay, you know how hard it is to make a straight line and a, and a right angle without it buckling, warping, crack, you know, all the stuff that goes wrong. And I wanted to do it, I'd never done it. And so I made these, it took two years to figure out how to make them. And, uh, uh, and I, they're all, they're absolutely fabricated by hand. They're all, it's all, they're all handmade and it's all reductive, you know. And uh, I, I was polishing and grinding and, and getting things. It was a matter of being precise. And um, without, there's ways to be precise and there's ways, and then you don't want to be overbearing. Though. You don't want to just smother your work and torture it, and, you know. So that, that's, that's always the interesting division in working with clay. Can I? How can I make, give something a, how can I make something look natural? And even if it's hard to do, make it look easy or make it look, give it some grace, you know? So that, that was my job, making these things. And um, I liked them because they're terracotta and they're so simple. They're just so elemental. And they had right angles. They're nothing but right angles. And I hadn't done that. And so it satisfied that need. It took about two years to figure out how to do it with a lot of failure. And then I couldn't show them. Nobody wanted to show them at that time. 
It's like 2012 or 13, something like that. No one to show them because the people I was working with just said, that's not your work. It doesn't look like your work. It's like, what do you mean it doesn't look like my work? You know, it's like a vessel with stuff in it. What do you want? You know? <laughs> but but that's, the, that's, the, that's where things were back then, and so I kept them. I, it's the only work of mine that I own. All, I've never kept my work. I've always done something with it, sent it out in the world. Mostly I wanted to send it out in the world, and I live with other people's art you know, or stuff from history. Uh, I think that's more interesting. I love making it, but it's, it needs to go out in the world and do stuff for me and carry a message. And then, um, but I, I ended up with these, and I, I gave them away. I was giving them to auctions and things, fundraisers. People would say, do you have anything? I said, sure, take that. You know? <laughs> And I've been getting them back. I've been trying to find out who's got them. <laughs> and uh, I want them all back now, you know? And there's, there's one here that's owned by an artist that she's not giving it back. I can't, I can't, I can't get it back, so that's all right. Um, starting to wind down here a little bit, but hope you're hanging in there. Um, so my work, again, was that, that whole idea of challenging an institution in your work I'd only, for, for 25 years, I'd made horizontal open vessels that had objects in them. And I just thought, I can't keep doing this forever. It's not, it doesn't hold enough water. You know, I, I, um, I, I need to make things that are vertical. Simple thought is that. I, I, I need to make vertical objects. Just really simple thoughts, you know. But that you have to pay attention to. It doesn't have to be a complicated thought to make art. You don't have to save the world to make art, you know. There's a lot of ways to make art. And listening to your inclinations and your, your intuition and things like that are important. And so I uh, started to work very differently. And that also was a big problem for me. Nobody wanted to show it. You know. But I, don't, I didn't care about that so much. And I mean, it, it, it bruised me to hear that kind of stuff coming from people I worked with. But I, it had nothing to do with stopping me. You know. And it made me mad, actually. It's like, you'll pay for that. <laughs> You're going to want to show that. Well, you know, the interesting thing is that when you make stuff for 10 years or 12 years, it becomes so refined and evolved that it has a completeness to it. And you start making things for six months, and it feels amateurish in a lot of ways compared to the stuff you just finished making. And it needs time to evolve and grow. And, and you know, then that's up to the artist. It's up to the artist to make things that are interesting. It's not up to anyone to love it automatically. So. I started working, um, I said, I, like the shapes I was making when they were horizontal, it was, a, it was all kinds of different shapes, you know? And I was really revolving through an inventory of making elemental, but uh, a variety of forms, and then putting things in them. And I, I kind of flipped the script. I thought, I'm just gonna make cylinders for a while. And the, vari the variable will not be the contents, the variable will be the skin. And, but the cylinder will, will be the constant. So that kind of flipped. The fact that it was horizontal and then became vertical, that kind of flipped. And the fact that I was moving into color made, made for a completely different class of objects that I was gonna make. And the more I started to do that, I also felt like I needed to get away from craft. I grew up in the world of pottery, you know? I mean, all, all teachers were teaching out of a, the basis of pottery and the necessity of craft protocols for pottery. And, and so that's the way you learn, that's the way you think, and, and ceramics kind of punishes people that take risks, you know, with failure, so-called failure. And, and so those are things I had to shake, you know, I, I didn't like them, they're too constraining, and I needed to become more intuitive in my work and just let go of stuff. Um, that's, that was also, you know, making things without a master plan that I had done for decades, you know. I needed to make things and just know where to start, just start something. And then um, I would uh, build on that and fire multiple times and add and subtract and try different things. And what I found that was really interesting to me was that the, the work in the, the, all the horizontal work was, had a blueprint, had to have a blueprint before I started. And it, it was minimalistic in nature, so it kept refining itself down. You know, if you work in a minimalistic way, you're in a funnel, and you're, you're heading down a funnel into a smaller and smaller territory, right? That limits the ideas. You keep eliminating things because it's minimal. This way of working, uh, this way of working, um, is intuitive. And so things happen, and you just pay attention to it intuitively. You allow your intuitive life to operate, you know? 
And, then, and so it suggests stuff, and you just listen to it, and you try something, and let it suggest something, and you try it again. And so I was able to kind of break with craft protocols that relate to ceramics or pottery, and uh, you know, I didn't have to make something, glaze it, fire it, and be done. I, I, I'd be done when I was done, and I would just keep changing it and growing it. And things would come out of the kiln I'd never seen, and, and that would start another idea. And so I felt like I was going back up out of the funnel, and, and intuitively and, and kind of er, eruptively into color and all kinds of different possibilities. And I just tried to pay attention to all of it and live through all of it you know, artistically. And I really liked it. I liked it a lot. I love the way I work um, no matter what, and I, and I think that it's really interesting to examine yourself as an artist over time and to find all the different ways in which you might be inclined to work and make things. You know? it's, a, it's a self-examination in a way, and uh, it's also a self-actualization. You're actualizing who you are by being creative in as many different ways as you can be creative. And, uh, and I think that's been a really rewarding thing for me because I've been engaged as a teacher very seriously for a long time, you know, since, since high school in a way. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very proud of what I was able to start and accomplish um, with a lot of help from a lot of people, but at Long Beach State in 35 years, and then all the programming we innovated and all the things we did. And, uh, but at the same time, I never wanted to stop working. I always kept working. I'm very proud of that too. And, and so I've been able to kind of really examine lots of different ways in which I might make something. And, um, and so that, that self-actualization um, is, is tremendous, um, understanding who you are, right? These things, I don't know how well you can see them, but they're in the show. And they're, uh, they're a little bit radical for me. I, uh, I'd fire them upside down. I'd layer all kinds of incongruous materials. I'd fire at different temperatures. I didn't take notes. I, you know, that's kind of knowing what you're doing is a big part of craft. <laughs> I know what I'm doing, but I, don't, I didn't take notes because I didn't want to copy. I, I wanted to each, each piece to be its own kind of unique thing. If I could remember something, I would, but by the time you fire something five or six times, you fire it at different temperatures, you put different things on it, you don't know where you are if you, if you uh, don't take notes. And I like that. I like not knowing how I did that. Maybe I could recreate it, maybe not, but maybe something else would happen along the way. And failure became such a really interesting thing. You know, we all try not to fail. Fa failure finds us all easily enough, you know, all the time in life. But failure in art, and especially in ceramics, um, is so highly functional, so necessary. It, it's the only reason ceramics evolved. People failed and figured out paid attention to the, fail, the failure and innovated something out of that. It's a great teacher if you, if you look at it the right way, right? And so, like, like I said, I grew up playing baseball, and so um, there's something about doing things that are really hard that I like. You know, baseball is really hard. I mean, you can, you can go to the plate 10 times and fail seven and be a genius, right? And, and so ceramics is not quite that bad, but it's, it's hard and there's a lot of failure and you, you kind of understand the value of failure. If you pay attention to it, it's not about being despondent, it's about paying attention and figuring out how to, how to create your way out of that and learn things. You know, you, I, I have a lot of craft wisdom in me, I don't mind saying that because I've been around so many people making so much stuff for so long and we've had to figure out so many problems, you know, and that builds wisdom, really, in relationship to craft and, and life too. You know. But anyway, that's, so these works um, started to become kind of magical to me. I, I couldn't always explain what happened. I didn't even want to. I knew that if I was going to make stuff I had never seen, I would have to try things I've never tried, you know. And so I was willing to try anything. And I, I kind of didn't care if I lost work. I was willing to give up work. And if I could trade it for a little bit of information, great trade all day. So I've lost a lot of work over the years, but I've, I've been able to do things that I, that I feel kind of astounded by that feel a little bit magical to me. The, the, the magical in the way the natural world is magical. These are all earthen materials. It's earth science, minerals, heat, time, you know, things like that. And continuing to try to understand color, discover color that's uh, when you open a kiln and you're surprised or at least interested or if not amazed. And these are all kind of natural phenomenological things that are um, 
built up over time, multiple firings and the addition uh, and sometimes subtraction of things. And so, like I said, it's really hard for me to know what I've done to some of these. And some of these are cannibalized. The orange piece has got a bunch of another object tacked onto it and fired, you know, broken from some other piece. And, and sometimes the, like this, this green piece has got stuff in it that would, you could kill yourself with it, so toxic if you didn't handle it well. And uh, so I'm careful with that kind of stuff. And I <laughs> made one, I think I'm done. <laughs> but it gave me a color I hadn't really seen, you know. And so like, like this work versus this work, you know. Both were in the show. And in, in this work, I have to become a little more conscious as a, as a painter. You know, I actually use a brush and I paint. I make a, a painter's kind of decisions. And sometimes I feel like I'm building a painting and sometimes I feel like I'm painting a building. You know, I don't, it's, it's kind of confusing in a good way. And I, I have to be conscious about color. And these things are more like color events, you know, where I don't touch the piece with, with my hands or with, with a brush. They're, they're, I'm cascading colors and allowing them to commingle and firing commingle, and then things happen that I, uh, I'm less kind of directly responsible for or cognitive of, you know, and, and I'll, I, I encourage that, I allow that. It's a pouring, pouring event. These things I'm sculpting with glaze. These, all these chunks and things are, are, are uh, the, the, the black piece on the left is all, all of those protrusions and uh, accretions are pure glaze that I've sculpted and attached and then fired on. So just it's a lot of things that are for me kind of quiet, private arguments with craft history, craft protocol, how you're supposed to make things, how you're supposed to use things, sequence and you know. And, I, and so I'm sculpting with glaze, which is not very typical. You're, you're more typically coloring something, finishing something with a thin skin of glaze. These are moon jars, they're, they're out in the show, and um, all, all of the rocks are made. They're, they're made by me, I make the rocks. You know, they're, they're also kind of combinations of all kinds of stuff out of the dumpster that gets fired. Uh, we, we got these great dumpsters with stuff in them. I go in there and dig it out, put it together, fire it, crack it, we got a beautiful rock, you know. And then the piece on the right is it's just a playground. I, I'm just, I have all kinds of little tests that I'm doing all the time. And these moon jars are, are back to kind of displaying objects, you know. And I, I felt like uh, that they're, the, the closest thing to me in history were the Greeks where they would paint pictures of, you know, mythological scenes or battles or whatever they want to commemorate on the outside of a jar. And this is my way of doing that too, of kind of commemorating things on the outside of a jar on shelves, like a display of, kind of natural sciences, magical things, you know. Um, these things, this is the cover of the book, you know, but uh, th these things are little color knots and I, they're, they're scraped up when I have these cascading events with a slip, spill and catch, there's all kinds of shit everywhere. And I don't want to waste it because it's so expensive. And so I let it dry up a little bit and I scrape it with a putty knife and make a shape out of it and fire it. And I'm, and I'm trying to just use things and you know, let one thing lead to another, let one idea bounce off another. Okay, finishing up now, thank you. Uh, so perforated objects, I did that for a long time. I found it fascinating because I didn't find it meditative. I found it very challenging. I had to pay attention, I had to really be alert. I had to be present. And I think that that's one of the things I'm really happy about. I, I walk around and look at all these different works from different decades, and I can, I can see I was present, you know, with the work. No matter how different they were materially, conceptually, technically, I, feel, I can feel that I was really present. I was really there trying to work that stuff out. And, but more so with, with this than anything, you know, because it's, it's laborious. And I used to do it with a Makita drill, you know, I'd duct tape the handle on a single speed and do this until my arm fell off. And it was so coarse, you know. And I found a, a, a Dremel, and so I started doing it with Dremel. It changed everything. I could make things bigger and more complex and more dense, and I really just wanted to eliminate as much material as possible with holes and replace that with light. Simple as that. 
It's an argument, again, another argument with clay that's always earthbound, always gravity prone, always dense, opaque. And I, I wanted it to see if I could, um, it could not be that. So I was really trying to make things um, that were ephemeral. You know, I could, I could turn something from sh shapes that we knew very well to things that were ephemeral, to things that might levitate, to things that were an apparition. You know, I, I wanted them to kind of disappear, be ghost-like. How well I did that, you know, that's, that's for anyone to judge. But th those are the things that motivated me. And I, I would just try to put holes as close together as possible without collapsing the shape so that, um, so that those things could happen. And um, like Ron said, you know, they, I, I lost a lot of these. There's no playbook. You can't go buy a book that tells you how to do this, like a lot of stuff. And so I had to learn <clears throat> slowly over a long period of time by wrecking stuff, you know, and then just being very, not being so disappointed that I, <laughs> I had to walk out of the studio crying, even if I wanted to. But uh, I was like, what just went wrong? How can I make sure that, that doesn't happen again, you know? Because these things look rational in a way, to some people maybe, because they're so organized, you know, but they're not at all rational. Maybe some of the most irrational stuff I've ever made because I have to make a solid model, I have to make a mold, I have to cast it, I have to perforate it, I have to clean it, I have to fire it, I have to apply glaze four times and fire it four times, and, you know. It's, the, it's wildly stupid, you know. <laughs> but I never cared about how much time it took me to make something. That didn't matter to me. I, I've always felt this urgency to make, you know, but I, I understand how to slow the world down enough when I have to, to make the things I need to make. And I didn't care if something took a month or took a week or a day, you know, whatever. The time wasn't, didn't matter. And so sometimes these took a lot of time, you know, there's a lot of investment. And, and so to me, they were acts of devotion. And I, I'm, I'm kind of moved by acts of devotion, whether that's in real life or in art or whatever, you know, wherever you find it. But that's the way I, I thought about them. I'm, gonna, I'm finishing, I swear. The last two slides, these, these are not in the show. We couldn't bring them because I couldn't find this one. I don't even know where it went. <laughs> I was busy, you know. I couldn't do every, I, I was really bad. I, I, I think it's so interesting. Like, I could find some things because I knew where they were, and, or a dealer that sold them could find them, you know. I don't live most of the dealers I work with. Um, and so I had to go back and try to find records and 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 because I, I didn't I wasn't good at keeping them because I didn't think anyone I didn't think it mattered I never thought it mattered I never thought I had an audience that cared really not much the audience was so slow so small for fine craft in the 90s 80s 90s and, uh, compared to design audience or contemporary fine art audience things have changed a lot but I I, I just didn't think it, who cares why would I spend all my time at a desk I can be in the studio working you know organizing all my stuff. So I, a lot of pieces are gone. I have no idea where they went. I could probably do this show two times again, at least, with all new stuff, you know, if I could find it, <laughs> right? So I, I just wanted to show you these, though, because I was, I was, the Dremel allowed me to make stuff like this. And uh, sometimes I talk about so scale of things because I don't, I don't know that that really matters much, except that there's a lot of misunderstanding of scale. There, things are always bigger than people think they are. And, and so some of these are, for, for what they are, some of these were quite large. I think the, the taller of the stacks back there is like almost three feet tall. And, um, and so uh, I, I love the challenge of making these things and um, the, the risk, and a lot of them broke. And I, I just love overcoming, I love winning the argument. That's what it is, right? <laughs> So with that, and I love the Long Beach Museum of Art. Thank you. <laughs> My daughter said she wanted to ask the first question. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> She'll kill me later. Yeah, but I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah. So okay. the earth works are porcelain. No. They're not. No. They're terracotta. Yeah, they're earthenware. I, I didn't say it, you know, but I, I, I wanted some confusion, some material confusion. I mean, I think terracotta is terracotta, but I didn't, 
I, I, I didn't really want you to know what temperature I was firing to or what materials I was, I wanted it to be hard to identify that stuff. Just because you solve those problems quickly and you start to, you start to not need to contemplate what you're looking at. You know? So a lot of things um, are a little confusing like that, materially and te technically. Did you ever use anything, I mean, besides ceramics? I mean, like metals or, you know, wood or anything that, there was one long piece that you said broke, you know, and, and was that like, like made of wood or, you know, or scissors or? That, no, that, that was all clay. That's why it broke. <laughs> but you know, I mean, I've worked with wood, I've made furniture, I've blown glass, um, I, 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 I've, I've cast bronze, I've done a lot of things. I you combined them? Together? Not really, I, it's hard to do. And uh, I feel like it's hard enough to work with clay. And I, um, I, I think that I, I have this kind of intuitive and long-standing understa you know, understanding of ceramics. And, and I understand in, in my own assorted languages how to make it talk. And I don't feel that way about other things in the same way. If I did, I would, I'd do them. I could have been a glass blower early on when glass blowing was coming up, um, but I didn't like that you couldn't touch it. You know? <laughs> and I, I probably would have been wealthy had I been a glass blower, right? Say lovey. Uh, this, there's a hand up over here. So you have, this is fantastic. Thank you so much. And you mentioned that you're often working on several different ideas or, or bodies of work at a time, or at least dabbling in different things. Um, I'm wondering what's piquing your curiosity right now in your studio in terms of those multiple, the multiple ideas that come together. I'm, I'm working on a really big commission right now that's killing me. And I, there's no room for anything <laughs> except this. I can't wait to finish it. And, but I, I've got some shows coming up. And one of the things that's really interesting to me is that in working with all the artists I've worked with at, the, at, at Long Beach in, the, in our center there for 20, 30 years, 35 years actually, um, is that I've been, a, I've been a collaborator or a facilitator with a lot of them. And I'm, I'm, we're gonna have a collaboration show with maybe six or seven of those artists I've worked with in the past. We're gonna make new work. And that's really interesting to me, you know. And so I'm going to be doing that in the coming year as soon as I get past the... And I'm also making work for my... for a solo show. I, I mean, I'm going to start making the work. And I, and I think... I'm just thinking a lot about flow right now. That's what's in my mind. But I haven't gotten to the work yet. But I can't wait to start working again, you know. It didn't kill me. This uh, retrospective didn't kill me. <laughs> Arti artistically. Yeah. Still breathing. Still breathing, yeah. How you use objects, like you were talking about collecting things and making forms out of them and turning them into blocks. How did you do that? And what materials did you collect and use? And how did you do it? Well, I think you're talking about a couple different things there. But um, so things I collected on the beach were actual objects that right. styrofoam, tennis ball guts, crushed beer cans, stuff. But it washed around so long in the water that you almost couldn't identify it. There's just some very, very subtle identifiers there. And I, I kind of like that they were mysterious like that. So I would take those things and take them back to the studio, those things, take them back to the studio and find a way to translate that into ceramics. Okay. And there's about five different ways you can do that, four different ways you can do that. And whether you're molding it or saturating it or coating it or, you know. And so I, for those pieces, that's what I did. Those are real objects in the world, you know, that all different materials. There were some, there were most of the shapes that have these kind of organic geometric abstraction, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of different work in there like that. Those things, I would make a solid model. I just sculpt it out of clay, absolutely solid. And then, especially for the perforated piece, then I cast it, I make a mold and I cast it and slip so that it had a uniform wall and for perforating. So I had to make a solid model, take a mold, then cast it. And then the, the, the moon jars with the rocks, that's just, everyone's detritus, you know, stuff they threw away. And we have a big dumpster for, for clay, plaster clay, stone, you know, stuff like that. No organic material, paper, you know, glass. And I would just take that stuff and, and make a mound make a, and, and fire it. Oh. Just fire it hot and then hit it and oh. break it into a stone. 
and re would reveal all the different assorted materials that were in there, whether the glaze and clay materials, different clays. And it's just like the earth, you know. Okay, so it wasn't metals and glass, and it was all, it had all these. Metals and glass are related to, I mean, it's all, it's all the same material in a funny way. Same material. It's all it's all kind of earth minerals, you know. Whether it's whether it's refined into metal, refined into glass, refined into ceramics, it's all the same language. It's just different separations of materials, different temperatures, you know. So I, I well, you know, I did use glass and I did use metal in a way. Yeah. Sorry. Good for you. <laughs> I wish I'd have done that. I find your work so different from the way that they do work in Paul. What, what, what year, if you mind me asking, what year did you turn down a scholarship there? In the 70s. Okay. okay. And your work is, to me at least, so diametrically created in terms of the jazz component. A lot of people in, in ceramics related to craft. Um, it was part of the, the way people worked, you know, that they would become super good at something so that they could compete and kind of own some little piece of real estate, you know. And then that would become a legacy thing, and they'd just keep making it. You know, you still see a lot of that. And Alfred's teachers at that time were a lot like that, and about refining something. And, and so they taught that way. They, they believed in that and taught that way. I had just come back, by the time I got there, I was 10 years out of undergraduate school and I just came back from Japan where I worked for three years with the most intimidating human being I've ever been around. And I'm not kidding, I was so intimidated by Shimoka. You know, he fought in World War II, he's a prisoner of war, he's just tough, even his own, his kids and his workers were scared of him in a way. He wasn't, he was just powerful, you know. So the teachers at Alfred weren't gonna intimidate me at all, and <laughs> at all. And, and I, was, I was in my 30-something by then, you know. So I just, it was just a big, it was just a big exploratory workshop. I did all kinds of stuff, and they didn't like it, you know. And they, but they didn't know what to do with me because they, uh, for, when it came time to a critique, where you get in trouble in a critique is if you got three things, you have one thing, you know, and they just, and, and you stand back and let it be mysterious. And they couldn't even walk into my space, so full of stuff. But all kinds of stuff, they didn't know what to do, you know. So they didn't like it, though. And, that's the way it goes. I didn't care. <laughs> Practical question. Yeah. How did you determine how long did some of those larger pieces take to dry? And how did you determine it? And who was actually moving the pieces into the kiln, in and out of the kiln? Or is that how to convert your glass? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, I've blown a lot of stuff up, you know blown a lot of stuff up in my time because I didn't dry it enough or fired it too quick or whatever and it's just, but up until just recently, my daughter actually helps me now and I've got, a, I've got another assistant helping me now, first time ever. And I never wanted help. I always wanted to do it myself because I always uh, like this, this thing and there's a bigger one in the back there. I, you know, we, I was talking to Steve, the preparator here, and, he's like, and I said, you know, I moved that by myself. I made it by myself. I put it in the kiln by myself. And he's like, how did you do that? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember it. No, 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 but it's huge, you know? And I, and I wanted to, I, I think it was just part of being creative, you know, to figure out how to do these things by yourself. And I liked it. And I didn't want to ask for help. I wanted to figure it out. And I ended up hurting myself that way, yeah. How much do these weigh anyway? I mean, uh, I mean that's hollow. Oh, the, hollow. This might weigh as much as that. That's so, they're all solid and, and full of stuff. You know. That's hollow? That's hollow, yeah, of course. Really? Have to be. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, most of the things I've made are hollow. Not always, but, yeah. Has your love for baseball inspired any of your work? I don't know about that. I have a, my son will attest to my love of baseball, something we share, you know, but I, 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 I think, I think about it all the time. I don't know that it has, to be honest, um, directly, you know, where you could trace it. Um, but I, 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 there's still things about baseball that I think about all the time. I think about how to field a short hop, you know. I think about how to swing at an inside pitch. And it's about the physical, you know, and, I, and, and ceramics is a lot of 
um, is a lot about the physical. And, I, and so there, there's, some, there's something connected there in the physical. It's like being engaged physically with things and materially with things and moving your body, using your body a lot. And I, I think about that a lot. Maybe that, that's as close as it gets directly, though. But thank, that's a good question. Yeah. How do you keep yourself out of like a creative rut, like a writer's block? Or... Did, did you hear the list of institutions I studied at? <laughs> and uh, it was like six institutions, three degrees, 11 years, 15 teachers. And, and so when you, when you do something like that, when you, and I think I, I followed up by saying, life is long, prepare well, you know. And like I've been working for 50 years. So like when you get into the studio, you know what you're doing right away, or do you have like a I always have stuff going on, um, and I, I, writer's block probably comes from over critiquing, you know, and I don't do that. I don't do it until it's done. I let it have a life, you know. I leave it alone. I leave my ideas alone. I just, I, if I, if I want to make something, I give myself 100% permission to make it, just to see what it'll look like. And a lot of times you make, you'll do that, and you'll start something that's nothing. But if you, if you listen to your internal, you, listen to, you let the work talk to you, you know, and it takes time for things to evolve. You know, those wire cut pieces took, well, the first things I did that way were just a cut, a cut through a piece of clay. I was like, hmm, that's really interesting. How can I, how can I use that, you know? Well, I don't know. But, Let's go try something. So there's a lot of goofy stuff and some failure. And, but you can see it growing. And you, you teach yourself how to grow ideas. And like I say, I, I just stay out of the critique business. I, you know, if, if you were a student of mine, I could talk you out of anything. I could tell you how bad your idea was and you shouldn't make it. I could make you hate your work, you know, because ideas are tender. So you got to leave them alone. And, um, and then, but, then, but then critique them when they're done. Chris Miller and I talk a lot, but hardly ever about work in progress. It's mostly at the end when things are done. Sometimes work in progress because we, we have trust, you know. But you, you just got to leave stuff alone and let it grow. Be patient. It takes time. Yeah. It's hard, though. It's hard in the age of Instagram. <laughs> All right. <laughs> when you, uh, you went from very structured, where you were controlling the media, uh, media and Yeah, I, I, think, I think it was that, that thing I mentioned about breaking certain institutions in my work and making work that's in that, you know, like those horizontal brown commemorative vessels. You know, I, I did that for a long time. And I, and I just, I felt like it was running dry and something needed to change. And so um, I, I wanted to work in new ways and, and, and certainly color was one of them. And I, I needed to... I was starting to work into color, but I needed to work into color. I wanted to work, and so I never worked vertically. And to put color on a vertical surface is really different than to put color on a horizontal surface because you put color and you encourage it to move. You overfire it or you add flux or whatever it is, and then stuff starts to happen that you can't control or you, you can't explain. And I liked it. And, and so it, it built slowly, you know, but the, the, you, know, you can see the end results. And, I, and the more I did it, the more I paid attention to it, and the more I let it become its own thing that, didn't, that wasn't obliged to all the rules I used to use in the past. It, set, it grew its own set of rules, you know, like I didn't keep notes, I didn't, you know. And um, it, 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 uh, it became its own institution, you know, um, had its own institutional value and values and things that were important to it. And, uh, you know, I've been doing that for about 10 years, too. So it takes time, but things grow over time. If you just stay at it, just stay curious. Um, be kind to yourself a little bit. Uh, be harsh if you want when it's done, you know. But be kind along, <laughs> be kind along the way. Brian.
expand that change, it also seems to me like you've been very much a part of that, continue to be a part of, of giving clay to people, bringing people to clay, and sort of helping it grow. How does that feel to have been here in, in this moment for Straddle as your life and career kind of see this, this change? Well, like, like Brad, too. Brad was showing stuff when I was in school. I saw it and some of the first stuff I saw in Carmel in a gallery and really powerful to me. So he, Brad's also been a witness to a lot as a few other people have here too. And I, uh, the changes are phenomenal. And I never thought, I never saw them coming, you know, never, never thought we would end up here um, in the way, just the ways in which, first of all, LA has grown culturally in the last 10, 15 years, massive growth comparatively. And then th what that's allowed for ceramics, it's, it's given ceramics a seat at the table of fine art, which it never had, and for a lot of reasons. I mean, there's a lot of prejudice against clay and pottery and ceramics in terms of it being understood as art. And, but that's changed, you know? And um, I, I could kind of feel it coming. I could see it kind of coming slowly. And uh, I thought it was important to bring artists to school, uh, to Long Beach, to be to, to work amongst us and not to teach, you know, not to teach as professional teachers in, in an academic setting, but just to model artistic behavior to students. And, and we also, we didn't do things like go to Ensica, you know, we, we went to the Venice Biennale to look at art, not, you know. And so the, the culture of ceramics at Long Beach has, has been one of kind of respecting ceramics as an art form. And, and trying to foster that in our students. And then also, I, I had the, the very clear sense that, um, because I could see LA growing, um, I don't know when I started doing it, you know, full, with full, full throttle, but I, I kind of announced to myself that I, I wanted to change the culture in LA for ceramics. I just bumped the needle a little bit, you know. Just, and so I would take any artist working in LA that, want, that was a mature artist, that I didn't care what their medium was, uh, that wanted to work with clay, they could come work with us. And especially if they had projects for exhibitions or commissions or whatever it was. And I held fast to that for decades. And, um, and so I, was, I stopped bringing people kind of out of the field of ceramics, people that had degrees in ceramics. I kind of knew what they're gonna make. I knew how they're gonna talk. That's arrogant of me, you know, and it upset a lot of people. But I wanted artists to come and I wanted LA artists to come. And then of course, from beyond too, you know. But, um, to bump the needle in LA to make, to make ceramics better in LA, to make, uh, to make LA better for ceramics, to make it more exciting, to make it better for our students, to make it better for me and every artist that wanted to work with clay. So, it, you know, it was, that's a very interesting process. We, we worked with a lot of really interesting people over time. And, um, you know, bef just before I retired, I got to work with Simone Lee. Uh, a couple times and help her make work for the Whitney right before she did the Venice Biennale. And it, it's, it, it uh, you know, there, there are certain sea changes that w where things were just never gonna go back. And I think one of the big things, I'm, I'm very, uh, you know, Kristen Morgen's not here today. You might know who she is, she's an artist, tremendous artist. Who? Kristen Morgen, taught, at, like, taught with me at Long Beach for 10 years. And I felt like she, uh, going back to, to maybe, 2000, you know, early, early, early 2000s, very early 2000s. I thought I felt like she really started to shift the culture at Long Beach State towards art and using clay, and uh, <clears throat> and it, this kind of like no going back, you know. So I, I think it's great, man. <laughs> I think it, the opportunities that students have now. I've got undergrads having exhibitions, you know, and galleries. It's like crazy. I don't know if it's good, all of it, but it, it's, it's wild. <laughs> yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the travel program that you had at Long Beach for students? Yeah. I mean, I, I, felt like, I felt like we had a good curriculum. We had a great facility. You know, we really expanded the facility. We had 40 kilns. We had everything. But the curriculum was also comprehensive. But I, um, I still felt like for a student to go through a, a, a standard curriculum, earn a degree, and then be prepared for what they were gonna face, as I understood it, when they were done, um, it was insufficient. What we were doing was insufficient for them. And, and so I, I wanted students to travel internationally because my experience in Japan was life-altering, you know? And just, I think Americans need to get off the rock anyway, you know? 
And I dragged my kids all over the world when they were young. They're citizens of the world, you know. That's what I wanted. But so how do you, you know, the thing that's really interesting about Long Beach is we're a state college. And so a lot of these kids are first generation to school. Their, their parents never went to school. A lot of them work two jobs. A lot of them have never traveled. A lot have never been east of the Mississippi. A lot have never been out of the state of California. And some have never been on an airplane, if you can imagine that. And so um, it seemed like that, that's a, how golden is that? To take, to take a young person like that, find the money to send them somewhere, you know, to send them. We sent kids to 20 different countries of their choice, you know, for a while until the school decided that was too dangerous. <laughs> you know, it's like pretty wild. We sent kids, I mean, I, I don't know that I would do it today because they, all of them came back, you know. But <laughs> it's like, I was like, I really sent a kid to the Amazon, you know, because they wanted to look at crocodiles or something. Uh, anyway, it's kind of almost true. And sent, sent a kid to Bali to film the end of the world festival or something. It, it was, I wanted it to be dreamy, you know, so give me a dreamy idea, we'll find money for it. And then we had to group travel, and so we'd go to the Venice Biennale and stuff. But the thing that really helped me was the school, I, I never asked the school for any money. Um, I kind of didn't trust the school. <laughs> I didn't want them to be part of anything. I just wanted to do it. I, I thought they'd stop me, you know, which they, which they did as they found out about stuff. But um, <laughs> do it now, apologize later, whatever. <laughs> but don't, don't lose any kids along the way, yeah. you know, which I almost did. But um, the thing that really changed it, because we had to go out and find money. And it was like sometimes we had 20 kids that wanted to travel, and I wasn't going to say no to anybody. And just like I wasn't going to say no to any artist, when an artist came, if they wanted to make something, you know, if you're a potter, you're going to say no to everything. No, you can't do that. It won't work. It'll never happen. It's just, you know, mess up the equipment. Blah, 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 blah. So I just took no out, you know. And I didn't want to say no to a kid that wanted to travel, so we were scrounging to find money all the time. We had all these really interesting fundraisers. And I, and I just want to say that Ron really kind of got me going on how to seriously raise money. Because I believe you were a fundraiser in, in another life, you know. So you understood that, and, and you know, I mentioned John, you know, that Ron was very um, generous, and he brought us to his home, and um, helped us put together a fundraiser, and, and then he called all the donors to the museum and said, hey, you gotta come buy stuff and raise money with the, for the Long Beach, you know, it's like, I thought, you're gonna lose your job. You can't do that, you can't bring museum. <laughs> he did it anyway, and we made, we made $50,000 and sent kids all over the place, and it really launched us, it really taught us how to make money, and, and then, of course, Ron and David have been involved ever since in lots of different ways, just quietly, and are we done? Yeah. <laughs> What? Thank you, everybody. Become a member of the museum if you're not. Donate money. <laughs>